Eyes on Longmont, offering a diversity of topics about our community that will inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Eyes on Longmont. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. It's a great day. That's what we say. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Longmont. Hi, my name is Diana Lassick. My family moved to Longmont in 1954. I was in third grade. Um, I'm going to do kind of a Main Street tour of when I was a kid. One thing I remember is Johnson's Corner on the south end of Longmont. It was like a mini mart would be now. People would get gas there, go in and get pop or beer or coffee or whatever they wanted. Right up the road from that was the Roll Arena. I had a ton of friends, so there was always somebody to do things with. We would go to the Roll Arena or the movies on Friday nights or Saturday afternoons. The Roll Arena was so fun. We would get together rent our roller skates, do the hokey pokey on roller skates, go under the limbo bar, just have a great time. Going up from the roll arena north is downtown. I picked just a couple of things downtown to talk about. There's so many historic, wonderful things. The first thing that came to my mind was the Marlou shop. It's where Ron's Jewelers is now. It was this skinny little shop. They had gift things. But I'd go in with my mother when she'd have bridge or garden club. Back in the middle of the store there was this counter and they had mixed nuts and mints. That's where she would buy her goodies for her clubs. Next to that was J.C. Penney's. We shopped there. Woolworths was down the street and they had a soda fountain and a sandwich bar. One of the best things in downtown Longmont, which people always remember, is Dainey Pastry. Everybody would get their almond coffee cake. It was to die for. And it's, we've tried to replicate it forever. Going up from there, the Trojan Theater, which is now the Longmont Theater Company, was one of our favorite places to go. The first time I went to a play there, when it was the theater company, I felt like I'd gone back in time over 50 years. The seats were the same, the refreshment counter was the same, the ticket booth. The only thing missing was the big screen. But it brought back so many wonderful memories. Going up from the theater, between 8th and 9th in Maine is the old Longmont High School. I graduated in 1964, and we were the last class to graduate from that school. So many memorable times. Uh, a few years ago, there was an all-class reunion and they opened the school for us to just walk through and it brought back just those halls and looking into the classrooms brought back so many memories. Across the street from the high school was Jean's Texas Burgers and the building is still there, this little tiny brick building. From school we'd go over and get french fries or a burger 
My family would go there some nights for supper and it was always a treat. Jean and Georgia were the owners. They were from Texas. Jean wore this white chef's hat. He was like six foot something tall. Georgia was like five foot tall and she made the most wonderful pies ever. Going up the street north from there was Cheaper Charlie's. Guys worked on their cars all the time. So that's where they'd go for their parts. There'd always be a bunch of cars there and you'd always see the guys working on their cars around town. Up on 10th Avenue, this is a personal thing for me. My dad bought the Phillips 66 station when we moved to Longmont. It was called Lang Oil Company. The building is exactly the same minus the gas pumps. When, once we started driving, we would go in and usually Jim or Sully would come out, pop the hood of our car, check the oil, wash our windows, and pump our gas. A lot of times we had 50 cents for gas, and that was it. One of the big things in Longmont was dragging Maine. And at my dad's station, the cool guys with their hot cars would back up their cars up and watch everybody drag Maine. Everybody would honk, wave. That was our pastime. And Friday, Saturday nights, that's where everybody was. Across from the cemetery was the Hamburger Haven. It was the place to be seen. Quite a few of us worked there as car hops, pouring sodas, flipping burgers, but everybody would, the drug main would drive through the parking lot just to be seen. Then going up Main Street some more, we're almost out of town here, they built a Shakey's pizza parlor. And Shakey's had picnic table styles. Pizza was pretty new then, so everybody went there for pizza. Then they drive another couple blocks, turn around, drag Main again. Other things that happened on Main Street were the pet and doll parade. We would decorate our bikes with uh, crepe paper, we'd weave the crepe paper between the spokes, put it on our handlebars, decorate wagons. That was a big thing in Longmont, the Pet and Doll Parade and the Fair Parade. I am very thankful that I got to grow up in Longmont. I love this town. All the changes hasn't changed my mind. It's a great place to be. Happy birthday, Longmont. I'm glad I live here. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Rodriguez, and I'm 72 years old. And I've been in Longmont since I was uh, about two years old, I think. I mean, that's as far as I can remember. Uh, my parents uh, kind of immigrated over here from New Mexico, because my grandfather was a, a farmer in New Mexico, and he had a big plantation of bean farming over there. When his wealth went dry, he immigrated over here. He sold his land and immigrated over here to Longmont to work. And so we all came, my father too, and my mother. And I was like two years old, my brother was like three. And, and we've been here ever since. Well, they used to go back and forth, you know. And then just my dad started working for Melton Nelson. And 
Then he started working for the sugar factory and on and on. And he worked for 7-Up. He worked for, oh, just a lot of places. And then he eventually started working for the city of Longmont. My dad was a farmer, and he used to work out in the farm as a farmhand, I guess you would call it. And he used to be in irrigation and watching cows and feeding them and the whole bit, you know, him and my grandfather. And then my, he married my mom after he came out of the war. My parents got married in New Mexico in 1946. After they got married, my, my mom had my brother in 1947. And he's the oldest one, and then I was the second. And then after I was born, they moved over here. And they lived in the Mountain Allison Farms. He provided housing for them because he was, my dad was working for him. My grandfather says they just had to come because like there was no work over there in New Mexico. So they came and, and they pretty much would go back and forth. And then Mount Nelson didn't want my dad to leave because he was such a good worker, I guess. And so we never went anywhere, although we wanted to go to the fair so badly sometimes. I beg Nelson, the, far, the farmer, could my dad please have one day off so we could go to the fair, please? And he goes, Okay, Jenny, just for you. Okay, I wanted to go to the fair. And so we did go, and it was so much fun. And my dad used to pack us up in his uh, back of his truck because he had a dumpster truck that he used to, used to work in the farm to haul the hay and stuff like that. And he threw us all back in there, you know, in the back. You want to go? Get ready and hop in there. So we did. And he brought us to the fair here in Longman when it was here in Roosevelt, right here. And so... I remember they used to have the fireworks here, and they used to have music here, and, and the rodeos were here too. But anyway, we, we thought that was really exciting. So then we'd go home and we'd be pretty happy, you know, pretty happy. And my dad would take us to help him farm, like spread the hay for the animals, because we had to feed them. And we had to pick them up with those hooks and put them on our knees and push them up over the, and we'd feed the animals. And so he, his, uh, his boss, Mr. Nelson, he just said, well, we're just going to keep the whole family because they're all such hard workers. So my, my dad didn't have very much money for my brother to go to school. So Mel said, he's going to school. Right behind the, our house, there was a river. Uh, that's where we entertained ourselves there. It was so much fun back in the day. Kids don't do things like that no more. You know, it's just those games and stuff, you know, pretty sad. I wish there was more things to do like that, back, like back in the day. So much fun. We used to get on top of the haystacks and play King of the Mountain. And we go up to the top and throw the other person down, and that was the king, whoever stayed up there was the king, and that was so much fun too. So then from there on, we just stayed in Longma. Yeah. Yes. Then as we grew up, you know, well, we, we started going to grade school here in, in Idaho Creek, over there by that Rinstore Church that's out there going on that highway, if you ever see it. And then after that, I went to school in Erie High School, and that's where I stayed for a long time. Then I went back to New Mexico because my grandmother was having problems with my grandfather because he had, had a stroke. So I, I got sent back there from my dad and mom, so I could help them out. So I was raised with them, and I was raised here, too, back and forth. And uh, yeah, where well, we lived with Mountain Nelson and that one farm, the house burned one day. It was a cold, cold day, and I remember it was snowing so badly. We all stayed home, and my grandfather kept us warm by putting fire, you know, in, the, in those little wooden stoves. I don't know how it happened. The flute to the stove, came undone a little bit. And when the fire was going up, it must have caught fire there. But anyway, that's where the fire started. And it went down and smoked the whole house. And so then everything burned, all our pictures. Yeah. But after the house burned, we just moved to town. The people here in Longmont are so helpful, though. They helped us out a lot. Our house in, in town was a, on Collier Street. I think it was 715 Collier Street. I got married in that little house, though. When we worked at the turkey plant, 
my sisters were working there too after that because they were older now. And so I worked there on and off, like I said, just when I had to. We used to hang out at that pizza place in the corner. I remember there were a quarter piece, so we'd go there and everybody would order their own pizza, their own little, you know, slice, a quarter. <laughs> and I remember that it was such a happy place. It was such a happy place. And that's where we would meet after we went shopping. And we got paid weekly at the trick plant. Well, I should say, what was it called, Long Long Foods? Well, we went to J.C. Penney's and, you know, yeah, you know how you used to shop here in Longway. You went to every store there was and we shopped here. Okay, I, I don't know if you remember that accident that happened in Hover Street, that bad wreck where all those kids got killed. They were speeding. Um, Nina Urban and some Garcia people and Elsie Lujan, all those people got killed in that accident, but they're in the cemetery, all of them lined up, all the kids that died that day, right there. I was supposed to go with my cousin, Nina, that day, because she used to go pick me up. That day, my dad told her, no, you're not going. She's not gonna go. 64. He must have had a feeling, my dad, and he didn't let me go that time. He would let me go all the time, but that day, he was, yeah. my dad yeah. saved my life. He called me up when the news came on at 10, and he told me, Look, this is what would happen to yeah. you. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the story. Thank you, Longma. Happy birthday, Longmont. Hi, my name is Jackie Tono. My mother's name, maiden name is Mary Maeta. She's with the Maeta family here in Longmont. They were farmers way back in the old days. Um, Kikutaro Maeta came to, uh, actually he came to the United States via Mexico because of the Exclusion Act of 1882, he could not come up into the United States. So he went to Mexico, worked in Mexico for a few years in the coal mines, swam across the Rio Grande. Then he went to California and worked on the farms in California for a few years. In 1906, he actually eventually came and with his brother to Colorado. They ended up renting a farm in Canfield, and Canfield is now Erie. So they lived on the farm in Canfield. That's where my, um, my, my parents, well, my mother and her brothers and sisters were born. Grandpa actually went back to Japan in 1916 to get a wife, a picture bride. He married Yukino Hirano, and bought her back at the age of 19. I remember my grandma telling me I was only 19 years old and didn't know English, didn't know anybody. Came to the United States. They had eight kids. Um, they had four boys, Takashi Maeda, y Yushikino, which is Johnny Maeda, Toshiyuki, which is Robert Maeda, Hisako, which is Mary Maeta, later became a Tono, Isao, which is George Maeta, Sayeko, which is Martha Maeta, later became a Nishida, Satsuki, which is Mei Yamada, and Akiko, which is Ruby, which later became a Tanaka. So we are related, the Maetas are related to the Nishidas, which is Nishida Farm on Highway 66, and the Tanakas, which were out uh, off of Highway 52. 
Um, they farmed, and all, most of the Japanese who farmed here were vegetable farmers. So the Kanimotos were here, uh, the Tanakas were here, the Nishidas, the Miyazakis. They all were vegetable farmers. They farmed corn, sugar beets for the sugar factory. Um, they had um, onions and barley. So I know my uncle grew barley for Coors, and when the state fair was in town, he actually won a couple of uh, contests with his barley. In 1942, when the war broke out, World War II, the Colorado, uh, Colorado had Governor Carr at the time, and he was good enough, I guess, or the Japanese that lived in the inner states did not have to go to the concentration camps. So they didn't have to go to a camp here, um, but according to my parents and my uncles that it would have been maybe easier for them if they had been in a camp, as opposed to having to ha deal with the discrimination they had to deal with. Um, the first time Grandma and Grandpa were able to apply for citizenship was in 1956. And uh, I have a picture with all of the, what I call, Isseis, which are our first generation Japanese that came to the United States. They all studied uh, with a gentleman um, to get their U.S. citizenship in 1956. Well, I grew up in the big city of Chicago, and in order to get out of the city, my mother brought us back here to the family farm, and we ba helped babysit our younger brother, our cousins, and we helped work on the farm when we could. We actually mainly ate and got in the way. We ate the fresh fruits and got in the way, fresh vegetables. Um, and the, the best part about being on the farm was we learned how to drive when we were only 13 or 12 years old. So we got to drive the tractors. So we drove the tractors and that's where I learned how to drive. I learned how to siphon water out of irrigation pipes. Um, we, uh, we helped our our aunts and uncles pick corn, pick cabbage. Um, and then I know the big event was on Friday night or Saturday night when they would take all of our help to the, to the city to go get their groceries. And then we would get to go to the, we couldn't actually go in the store, but we would get to go into town to, to see the town. Uh, some memories I have, I guess, was when uh, the best Mexican restaurant in Longmont at the time, and I guess it was in the 70s, 60s, 70s, was La Casina at 3rd and Main Street. And, and sometimes we think we had to wait long to get into a restaurant now. Sometimes on a Saturday night or a Friday night, it would be an hour wait to get into La Casina because the, they had such good Mexican food. Um, when I first moved here, after college, I decided I liked the country life, so I moved to Colorado. And uh, I used to, my first job when I moved out here was working at Tanaka Farms. They opened the vegetable market, so I ran the vegetable market for them. I have lots of good memories of playing softball, um, with because Longmont had a good a recreational program, so we played a lot of softball. I had an apartment. Uh, in town. Eventually my grandmother uh, got too old where I had to go out and I did live on the old farmhouse um, and help take care of her um, until she passed away. So the Maedas had to sell their farm and as they were 
uh, dispersing all of the farm equipment and everything out. They had this big old red barn. I guess they made an agreement with the city or county uh, for fire training. They agreed to burn down the big old red barn. And so the fire department came out and they uh, set it on fire and they burned down the big red barn and this, the fire department was out there with their, doing their training for it. But uh, I, and I, you know, back in the old days, there used to be um, hotbeds and the hotbeds were like frames. I guess you call them raised flower beds now. And then they would have them so that they would do starter plants in them. And I remember my mother telling me they used to go in the fall when the cattails were 10 feet tall and go and cut them down and use all of the reeds from the cattails and, and build like a straw mattress to cover over the hotbeds to protect the seedlings as they were growing. And then in the springtime, uh, maybe in May, maybe April, I'm not sure, they would go and plant all the plants out in the fields, the tomatoes, the peppers, cucumbers, whatever, and they put these little tent caps on them uh, called hot caps. And then the, they would stay on the plant until it was warm enough and the plants got big enough and they would cut open the top and let the plants grow out of the hot beds and eventually they take the hot caps off of them um, and grow the plants that way. They were, and I remember my mother telling me that they used to have two old mules that did the, the plowing for them or would, would pull the wagon so they can load the, the vegetables onto the wagons and everything. And, and those mules would know when it was the end of the day and they'd go running back to the farm to, so that they could eat at the end of the day. So um, a lot of good memories. And I know, oh, my mother, well, actually all of them, went to the schools in Longmont. And I remember them talking about Main Street, 9th and Main used to be the old Longmont High School. And so every time we'd drive by, she'd point it out and say, that's where I went to high school at. All my cousins are born and raised here in Colorado. And they, they have went to the Longmont High School, the new Longmont High School and graduated from there. Uh, some of them have gone on to college at UNC or wherever, CU. Um, and have, they've grown up here, spent their lives uh, married, and nobody else went into the farming business after that. But. So my grandfather was really big on keeping our religion alive. We are Buddhist. And so since the Japanese community is so small here in Longmont, um, he actually helped develop and uh, build up the Denver Tri-State Buddhist Temple. But he, he actually, they actually used to meet in Lafayette first. There's a Isabel Road and 287. Um, there was a, like a VFW or Elks Lodge building over there. And I, I think we rented it, I don't know. Uh, and I remember going there and uh, th th because they're all farmers, we used to have service like on a Saturday night. And then it was a potluck or some, something afterwards. And so we would always go there. And eventually the Kanimoros, um, they, start, they were farmers in town and they started buying up property. And the Kanimoros ended up donating uh, the Burlington, uh, elementary school and that piece of land which is at the corner of Pike Road and 287 and they donated that to the Longmont Temple so that we re renovated it and Burlington School is now the Longmont Buddhist Temple and the Kanimoros also donated some land actually to another church and to the city so you now have Kanimoto Park and because of that, the city made an exception to their ordinance and they built the pagoda. So we have the pagoda at Kanimoto Park uh, that the Kanimoto's donated. So 
if you notice the names as I read them, Robert, John, George, Mary, they're all Catholic off of the Bible names because they couldn't speak English. They had people in town who were the friends that would give them names for the kids to use. Um, and they got all these Catholic names, hence John, George, Mary. And, and also part of it was George and May were born, um, is it February when George Washington's birthday is? So he was called George. I don't know, it was Martha. Martha was born in uh, February, so, and so she got Martha Washington. So she was given Martha's name. The only name that's different is Ruby, and Ruby got her name because um, my mother named her. Grandma could never say Ruby. She ought to say, Ruby, Ruby, and could never get the R's right in Ruby, but that's because my mother named her and didn't want to give her a common name like that. So that's how they got their names. And so because the Japanese were such a small community, two of the Kanimoto's, the two brothers, Jimmy and George, married two of the Miyazaki sisters. And then the, the Maetas, uh, two Maetas uh, married the Nishidas. You know, one Tanaka married a Tanaka. And then in the Tanaka family, two Tanakas married sisters from another family. So there's always a brother-sister combination that married brother-sister combination in another family. I, I did my duty and went to college. After college, I said, okay, I'm leaving. I'm coming to Colorado, and I'm moving to Colorado. So, and I've, I've never regretted it ever since. I, swear. I said, that was the best part of living here, is getting up and seeing the mountains every morning, and especially when it's fresh snowfall and it's nice and crisp. <laughs>
airplane out of uh, coming out of Denver going north. Uh, all of a sudden, we heard a big explosion, a big boom, and so we ran outside and barely caught barely caught a big old like a fire bomb or something coming down from sky. Uh, so we got in the car with my dad and drove up there north of Longmont. There was 55 of them on that United Airlines. And all of them, of course, the bodies and parts of it, whatever, ended up on that field. Uh, uh, probably uh, further north of where Walmart is now, a little further around that area is where all those bodies came down. And what, would, what happened was that uh, the son of one of the mothers that was on that airplane, he planted a bomb so he could collect her insurance. So he planned that bomb. I'll never forget that time when that happened. Like I said, I've been on raising this town for 77 years, going on 78. I've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. And that was probably one of the uh, bad. The ug ugly, of course, is when those two Latino kids were shot here in Longmont on Main Street by a police officer. That was the ugly. You know, it was tense. I mean, obviously, uh, I recall when we first initially met with the mayor, city council, and Ed Camp at, in the basement at St. John's Catholic Church is where we met. And uh, that, of course, that basement was full of Latinos. And of course, there was some white people too. And even standing outside, and we, that's when we first addressed them, and we were asking for you know, some questions, some answers. Why was so-and-so uh, officer on the street with hardly any training? Why was he carrying a 357 Magnum pistol, you know, the way he shot the kids with, which was illegal to, you know, uh, and uh, it was so tense. I really felt at that time that if I wasn't getting any progress made with them or I felt like, you know, this isn't going anywhere, to be honest, all I had to do is stand up and say, we're out of here. And I really believe that this place would have town maybe burned or something because that's, that, that's how mad or uh, upset uh, the Latino community was at that time. So, but we thought, you know, it's our, our problem, it's our town problem. Our group, uh, El Comité, we agreed that we're not gonna let any outsiders come in. And I did get calls from uh, act, act, uh, other groups that wanted to come in and help. We knew that if they came in, it would have gotten a lot worse. And yes, I did get threatening calls, you know, from people, uh, even threatening my wife, my family and me, you know. For example, go back to Mexico where you came. Well, even to this day, I've never, <laughs> never been to Mexico. And they threatened to shoot me, you know. I remember when we marched from St. John's Catholic Church to city council to make some more demands, I was telling my wife, you know, I can't, don't know what's gonna happen. I, you know, I love you and the kids because all the threatening calls that I got, you know, I was taking a big chance. And of course, so are the other members too, you know, to walk to St. John's and, you know, who knows? Tony Tafoya, he says, it was on our, initially one of our uh, founding members. He says, you know, Vic, if, uh, I feel like writing a letter to, I forget when it was back, I forgot one of those mass shootings that really got out of hand and let them know how we did things here. But, you know, times are different from 80 to now. I'm not so, if that ha shootings happen today, who knows? So I was the, initially the first president of El Comité, uh, which came into existence in 40 years ago. I was shocked by our son, who works for um, Colorado Public Radio. They thought that maybe the founders of, of El Comité, uh, which was myself, I'm the one that really founded it, Marta Marino, who is, was, he just retired, from then on and for 40 years, she was part of El Comité, she was president for many years, they felt that uh, being with that anniversary 40 years, that 
they should honor us, I guess, for for that uh, for that happening. And of course, I've been active since then also with different uh, uh, activities. But so it was a surprise to me. I I got a call and it says, Vic, you know you you've been nominated to, or to uh, be a Kara. I mean, what was it? Uh, I forgot the title already. But uh, yeah, it was a surprise that I was. There was other others in that group who initially with El Comité, there was a total of seven or eight of us that got it together. I feel that they should have been recognized too because without them working alongside with Martha and I, we wouldn't accomplish what we did. We did do a lot of um, work with the city police at that time. The mayor was Mayor Askey at, Askey at the time. Um, and we worked closely with him. Ed Camp, he was in charge of the police department and the fire department. So I worked closely with him. And of course, city council members. And we, we uh, the ones that initially started the ride along program, uh, we asked for better training because at that time, the officer who shot those two boys had only been in training like maybe a month or so, whatever. Uh, he really shouldn't have been on the streets because he didn't go through all the training he should have. Uh, so we implemented, with the help of the city, that to make sure that uh, all new police officers went through some extensive training prior to being on the streets, like you could say. So those are some of the things that we implement with the city. And we're, and to this day, they're still, uh, still doing so. I worked at the Wetzel Cutlery for 19 and a half years. I started working for them in Boulder, and then they moved the company to Longmont. And uh, when initially that shootings happened, my boss at the time, who was the owner, uh, Harvey Platts, was a great owner. I mean, I, I enjoyed working for him. Uh, he initially says, you know, Vic, I'm glad you're getting involved. He even donated some money to help to help us. But then uh, about six months into it, he called me in his office and says, you know, Vic, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to tell you this, uh, but uh, I'm getting some calls from people in the business section, I guess, or whatever, that uh, you're just maybe going a little, doing too much. And so I hate to say this, but you're either going to have to uh, quit working here or quit El Comité. You have to make a choice. And back then in the 80s, you know, you know, you're lucky to have a job. I had a decent job. I would, I would, I'd ran three-fourths of that plant. I had to put food on the table. You know, so I says, okay, I just had to quit El Comité. So it was hard for me to do that, uh, but yeah, my family came first. But it just wasn't me. There's some good people in this town that I grew up with that I think is helping keeping this, keeping this together. Um, yes, uh, I may be the face of a lot of things, but you know, I take it as a, as a, as a football coach, okay? Uh, the head coach gets all the recognition, right? But what would he do without his assistants, the people surrounding him, the ones that he gets advice from or, or whatever, you know? And if it wasn't for those people that I surrounded myself with, none of this would have happened. And then the coaching that I did for 39 years, high school on down, I, I, I believe me, I would enjoy working with those kids. I mean, I did it from when they were fifth graders all the way up to, to high school. You know, I uh, met a lot of parents uh, that are awesome. I, I'll see some kid, for example, I was at a restaurant, the wife and I, and we were sitting there having, eating breakfast, and, and then walked this big guy, you know, and walked by our table and he kind of stared at me, you know, and, I go, gee, you know, I, I owe him a dollar or something. I mean, what's, did I do something wrong? Or, 
So he walked by and he sat down over there in the corner and uh, he was eating and he kept staring at me, you know, and I was getting a little, uh, you know, what the heck's going on? So then he got up, and walked, paid, got up, walked away and he says, hey, coach, you remember me? I says, no, I don't, you know, and I forgot, the, <laughs> I forgot his name, but anyway, he says, well, you coached me for a couple of years in youth football. And I says, oh my God, you know, that's great. It's, it's just a, re, uh, a reward to see that you was part of a, a, of a kid when he was fifth grade, sixth grade, or one up. And then years later, he's, he's successful, he's done well. And at least I can say I had a little bit of part to do with that kid. That, that's my reward. I enjoyed Longmont. To me, it was a good city. It still is a great city. It's kind of expanded now, of course. Happy birthday, Longmont. Hi, my name is uh, Arlie Ostrander. Um, I was born in Longmont in 1944. And I was born in a midwife house between Bross and Gay on Long's Peak. Um, my grandfather started uh, plumbing and heating shop here in 1901. And that was still in business up to um, the 1980s when my dad and I were well, still running it. The population at that time was about 7,000 people when I was born. And by 1960, it was up to 11,000. But what surprised me was between 1960 and 1970, it more than doubled in size. And I can see why it did, because at that time, the FAA came into town, IBM came into Gun Barrel, so, and we had more and more businesses uh, coming in, so, but that, that really did surprise me, how it doubled in 10 years, so. And now, what are we up to, 100,000? It just seems unbelievable to me that it can be this big. But some of my childhood memories are, there was a bowling alley where Heffy's Mexican restaurant is now. That was a bowling alley at one time. I believe it was Lomont Lane's. We lived over on Emory Street, 500 block. And so uh, my dad was a bowler and his dad was a bowler. So we'd go bowling. And uh, when we got old enough, and I think we were only maybe 10, we got to set pins at 10 years old. And we get like five cents a, a lane or something. <laughs> but then we had a movie theater in the middle of the 300 block on the east side. I can't remember the name of it, but I remember going there on Saturdays and watching Superman and a lot of other serials, Roy Rogers and a little hamburger restaurant two doors north of um, First National Bank called Have a Snack. And it was real small, narrow um, restaurant. They had bar stools and they had maybe four or five little tables that only two people could sit at. A lot of the people that worked at Longmont National, uh, First National Bank went there for lunch. So you could see bankers in there eating. And um, but, um, this guy was like, uh, if you ever saw uh, the TV show Alice, this guy kind of reminded me of the guy on, on Alice that was the, uh, the cook, you know. He had um, some tattoos and, and um, but just a really nice, really nice guy. But just 
I know, just so good. The hamburgers were so good. So then we had um, Woolworth store, um, five and dime. We had Ben Franklin's. Penny's was um, in the at 460 Main. What, um, and what was unique about that store was it was three levels. They had offices up above the main floor and then they had a basement. And after you uh, picked out what you wanted to buy, you came up to the main floor and they had a vacuum system. And so you would write your check out or your cash to the cashier and she would send it up to the office <laughs> in a vacuum system, which I always thought was so cool. When I go in there with you know, my mom and watch that, those tubes go up that vacuum system. So then we had a lot of filling stations, Fifth and Main, Sixth and Main, SIG Service was one of them. And the drug stores, we had the Lawmont Drug, which was right across from First National Bank. And just two doors south of that was Lutz Drug. Across the street, next to Shy's Clothing, was Sheeter's Rexall Drug. And there was another drug store in the 500 block. And I can't remember the name of that one. But Sullivan's um, self-service drugstore was up on Long's Peak and um, Main Street on the west side next to a filling station. We used to play softball uh, over at Roosevelt Park in the summer. After softball, we'd come home and stop there at Sullivan's Drug and get a chocolate Coke or a phosphate. There was, the Dairy Queen was there, where it is now. Next to the Dairy Queen was a, a church called the Pillar of Fire. On up the street, well, there's the uh, high school, uh, the one and only high school at that time. And um, across the street from the high school was Brillhart's Grocery Store. Um, it was an old A&P store that had the hardwood floors, big buckets of peanuts, and you go in there and get your groceries and say, put it on my bill. And they keep track of your groceries for the month or for the week, and then you go, go pay them at the end of the week. And then next to the A&P, Brillhart's A&P store was a, a little hamburger shop called Gene's Hamburgers. Gene and Georgia left which moved here from Lubbock, Texas and started that little hamburger shop. The best chili in town and made chili burgers. So open face, you get two patties on two buns, chili and onions all over, spread all over and oh, it was so good. They had a uh, maybe six or seven stools bar at the counter and I think two four toppers in the front and then in the back she had a, a bigger table for bigger families that would seat maybe six but she made the best pies oh my gosh pies were so good she had the best pecan pies um, banana cream um, Texas cream, she had a Texas cream pie that was just out of sight. And she was just, she was famous for her pies here in Longmont. And then on the corner of 9th and Main, there was um, on the west side, northwest side, there was a poultry. <laughs> I don't know a lot of people knew that, but there, there was a poultry shop. They had live chickens, and, and you could buy fresh chickens from them. And then across the street, there was another little grocery store called the Corner Pantry. And it was kind of a, like a little specialty grocery store. 
chocolate covered ants, things out of the ordinary that you'd find in most uh, most stores. Yeah, so. And then on up the street, there was uh, uh, cheaper Charlie Harris uh, Auto Parts. He was a very famous person in Longmont. His son Gary, his oldest son Gary, and I were very good friends, and uh, we graduated from high school together. And uh, but he was really the first guy that came into Longmont that really was a wheeler dealer, um, cheaper Charlie they called him because you could go there and get the your auto parts, your oil and everything much cheaper than you could from um, other places. So on the east side, in about the middle of the block, was the A&W Drive-In. That was owned by uh, people who were, their last name was Willie. Uh, on both ends of Longmont, there were Johnson's Corner North and South. They were both, at one time, they were both owned by Joe Johnson, who was a big stockholder in um, Husky Oil Company. He had a house by the North uh, Johnson's Corner. And I understand, according to my dad, that there were some pretty wild poker games that Joe Johnson and his cronies had there. And what was neat about Hamburger Haven was that you could drive in one side, go around, and come out the other side. So you could see everybody. So, and everybody could see you because that was the thing. You wanted everybody to see you. And the car hops. And the car hops. So Valley Farm Dairy was over on um, just north of the Trojan Theater, about in the middle of the block there. And we would go to the um, Valley Farm Dairy and get a quart of orangeade. They made this great orangeade in these glass bottles. And it was a really quench thirster, you know, after playing football and, and basketball. So I remember, oh, it was so good. <laughs> and then on the corner of 6th and Main there, um, on the northwest corner, there was an Orange Julius. So, and then I have to mention this. Um, Sandy, my wife's dad, Bob Halloran, he uh, raised Black Angus cattle. He opened a drive-in in the 1500 block of Maine called the Black Angus. So he took his Black Angus and made um, Baron of Beef sandwiches, is what he called them, Baron of Beef. And oh man, they were just, they were, ha. Huh. And you had the juice with them, the odd juice, and, and you could get shakes there, you could get the fries, and, and uh, it, was, it was really very, very good. So I'm really surprised at how many restaurants, when you come to think about Longmont had. Um, there was a home, home, home cafe at 463 Main, and uh, Williams Cafe was in a 313 Main. There was two brothers. The one had the cafe here in Longmont. The other one had the Wayside Inn in Berthoud. The best fried chicken you have ever eaten in your life. They cooked it to order in big cast iron gillets. And it would take, on a Sunday afternoon, you're going to spend most of your time there <laughs> because it took about 45 minutes to get your meal. But, oh, it was mashed potatoes and gravy and, and chicken and for dessert, uh, chocolate, uh, chocolate um, ice cream, um, uh, wine sundaes. Yeah, the wine sundae. Um, you know, vanilla ice cream with a wine sauce over it. Yeah, it was very famous. It was a very famous place. If you want to know where La Casina started, La Casina started in the basement of the Dickens. Out of there, they moved down to South Main, where uh, Swanky Franks was, that area. And then they built their own building down there off of uh, Pratt Parkway. And Swanky Franks, anybody remember that one? That was a hot dog place. 
down there where it's uh, down there where the um, um, Santa Fe Grill is now. The little Episcopal Church on Fourth and Main on Sunday nights they would have teen dances there. That's where I learned to do the stroll and the, uh, I don't know all kinds of dances. And then they have hay rides. They would have hay rides. Um, and this was when I was in like seventh, sixth, seventh, yeah, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. So I am a native and very proud to be born in Longmont, Colorado. <laughs>
So they gave me a job uh, in appliances, selling appliances. And uh, I was lucky enough that the next day, the manager quit. So the manager from appliance quit, so uh, they didn't give me the job, but I got to work overtime and I got to work more. And since I speak, speak Spanish, you know, a lot of Spanish people were coming in, you know. I was, Kimmer was making good money there. I had a lot, a lot of customers coming in, so. And then one day, I went to, I had a day off, and I was walking down Main Street, and I, on Dent Street, and uh, on Third Avenue, over there, I think it was the American Lingo Building, they had a sign for rent. So I went there and asked him how much the rent was, and they told me $125, you know, so I said, yeah, that sounds good to me. So I went and ran it without telling my wife, without telling anything. Well, since when I went to Chicago, you know, I had connection with some people because, you know, like I said, I always make friends. So I knew uh, 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 some people that sell music. So I, I, called, <clears throat> I called them and asked them what I was going to do. And I told them to send me some music. So I, start, I started my business with 75 LP because there was nothing there at that time, you know, and little, little, little all this stuff. So I opened up the first day I was there. I stayed there 12 hours. I sold 25 cents. Uh, and I bought battery and one cent us. I had a room maybe 12 by 14, that was the store. And then there was a, and then uh, a store at 350 Main got empty. So I went and ran it. And like I said, you know, I'm being really lucky, so I get to meet people. So I went to meet the people on the radios and TV and stuff like that. So I get to get advertisement and I trade uh, LP for advertisement. So I did really good. So. And thanks to the good luck, you know, business started growing, 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 and, and I spent 28 years in there. And thanks to the good Lord, you know, I pay my house, I raise my kid, and, uh, and I'm here. But, uh, you know, London has been good to me. And, uh, and I only got four grade school. I only went to four grade. And, uh, you know, thanks to the good Lord. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, with that store and me and that, and then, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning, there was no, nobody speaks Spanish in town. No the city, no policeman, no store, no bank, nothing. So that's when I did, my store was uh, like a, Information center. We have people coming, asking, uh, "What can I find a doctor? What can I do this? What can I do that?" When we opened the store in the morning, there was like four or five people waiting outside to come in for my wife to help and fit a working application, a work application. Just did that. Almost every morning, there was somebody there. And then I, uh, and that's you know. Uh, that's when I, I decide for the Latino chamber because the, uh, I, there was a lot of people that didn't know how to go for information. You know, they want to open a store, <clears throat> and sometimes they open without finding out. You know, they had to get a information <laughs> from the city. You had to get a task number or that stuff. And I went and uh, I decide to to do something, and then. Uh, I started a Latino chamber. The first, you know, it was going really good. But unfortunately, my wife got sick. My wife got a stroke, and she paralyzed on the left side. So she's in a nursing room right now. And, and, uh, it's pretty hard, but uh, she was a good lady. She helped a lot, a lot of people. And I, I came to London. And London was, you know, it was lonely. There was, uh, from Main, uh, from 17 that way north, there was nothing, nothing, just 
uh, farms and stuff like that. So I like to raise my kids over here, you know. So I went, um, I told my wife that I was going to move here. <laughs> she said, well, okay, if you move, you move by yourself. <laughs> but that, which I brought it, and she loves here. She said, I will never live long, and I will never live long, and she said there. I knew some guys from the radio station. And uh, in 1991, I, I got connected with them. So we used to go to the <clears throat> minor league, the surfers. There was the surfer here first. So I got there with the radio, and uh, <laughs> like I said, you know, I made friends easy. So I met the general manager, we became really friend, good friend. Uh, he said, call me, he took, he take me, he took me down to the ball players, the clubhouse, took there to meet the players and all that all stuff. And, uh, and they, you know, it was good. And then for me, it was really good because I love baseball. So I was there, you know, doing, doing a lot of things for them and helping the Spanish people, you know, translated. And, uh, and you know, I, I feel like I was home, so, the, so I got to, you know, to know him and everything. So uh, I, don't, I think it was in 1992, I think, or 91, I, uh, I, I, I asked them <clears throat> if I could take some kids down to the ball game. And they told me, yes, you can. And uh, so I got connected with time calls. Yeah, and, uh, I got connected with them. Uh, the Lim family, they're really, really good people. And um, uh, we, we, we took 35 kids to the game, one game. And then another time, uh, I talked to the, you know, the surfer, if, we, if I took some people down, and time call, and I, we got connected, and we were selling tickets at half a price. So I think we took about a hundred some a hundred some people to a game, and some people came after that and they told me thank you. This is first game I ever been in, you know. It was and it was really 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 nice. And then from there, when the Rocky came, I, I did a lot of campaign from the Rockies with Federico Peña and some of the other people, and and we got we got the team in. So when they got the team in. With the connection with the surfers, I, I got with the Rockies, and I was translating for the Spanish people, Andre Calarraga, Benny Castilla, Armando Reynoso, Nelson Liriano, well, there were quite a bit of them. And then I used to go to spring training, and I, uh, I loved that with young kids, you know, sign up for the first time. And some of the, one time I went to the, to the apartment where they were, and, and one of them was crying. And, he said, and, they, and I asked him, why are you crying? I, I never been away from home. I miss my mom, I miss my dad, you know. You know, they, it was, it was kind of tough, because most of these kids, you know, they, they come from country, uh, they're born and they're fine, they hardly see people like that, that. So I talked to them, I told them, you know, this is, this is just the beginning. It's gonna get better. This banner was the first game of the Colorado Rocky ever in Colorado. It's, it was the inauguration game. Uh, this banner is a collector, collector item, you know, it's collectible. And uh, at that game, the, the biggest crowd ever been in a baseball game, I remember, was 82,229. And they did it at Maya High Stadium. That's the only place they could do it. And I was there with my wife, with my kids, and it, it, it seemed to me like I was in a candy store. You know, it was really, really excited. People excited. Everybody doing good. I remember the the guy that played second base, he hit the first home run in Rock, uh, Colorado Rock ever. And uh, it was, uh, and it was, 
I, I John, I think it was the last name. And uh, but I tell you, that was I was exciting. I was really, really, really good. I, I really, really enjoyed that game. And then from on, you know, I keep going to the games. And uh, I go to every game, every home game. So um, I was able to get, you know, have a pass, and I could go any place in the stadium. So you know, it was it, it was good, you know, just uh, enjoy meeting the players, you know, meeting players from different team, uh, different country, different. So it was it was beautiful. It was I really really that that's a memory that I will never forget.